Good evening and welcome to the new school. My name is Karen Cooney. I'm the director of the Vera List Center for Art and Politics and delighted to present to you the Public Art Fund talks at the new school tonight with Fiona Banner. As many of you know, uh, the Public Art Fund talks at the new school are a long-standing collaboration between the Public Art Fund and the Vera List Center for Art and Politics, informed and shaped by and through the presenting artists. Fiona Banner's talk tonight is no different and just an additional piece of evidence of such symbiotic crossings between institutions around the work of significant artists. Banner's current exhibition at the Icon Gallery in Birmingham, England, was recently reviewed in The Guardian where Adrian Searle pointed out that, and I'm quoting him, for an artist with such a mistrust of words, Banner uses a great many of them, end of quote. This embrace of, or even insistence on the paradoxical, on positions of contrariness, irony, or provocation strikes me as something that we all are all engaged in, that precisely in the face of enormous political challenges and serious questions about the political efficacy of culture, we continue to teach and we continue to commit to and we certainly continue to be guided by politically informed work such as Fiona's. This is what we pursue at the Verily Center and I'm very grateful for the Public Art Fund for providing us yet again with the opportunity to engage with this kind of work. Nicholas Bohm, the director and chief curator of the Public Art Fund will now introduce Fiona Banner. Thank you again very much for coming. Thanks so much, Karen. Uh, always a great pleasure to be here in the beautiful New School Auditorium, the, the original one, I guess. They keep adding new, bigger, brighter ones, but this is a really special space to be in and to be coming back to. And uh, I'm delighted that you've been able to join us tonight for what I think will be a special talk, and it's the concluding talk in our spring, uh, sorry, in our fall, season, um, and uh, we heard already from Yappa Hein and Hank Willis Thomas, two really um, remarkable talks, and I think this will be a fantastic conclusion. Um, I want to thank Karen Quoney and her team at the Vera List and here at the New School for their collaboration on this tremendous series, uh, and uh, my colleague Andrea Hickey and and others at the Public Art Fund that really work hard to, uh, to bring these, these talks together. Um, you know, I was, I was reminded, uh, and some in the audience will be old enough to remember too, back in the 1990s, when after a somewhat sleepy period, we began to hear a lot about British art. Uh, but that sort of came to be somewhat dominated by the YBAs, um, and it, it was sometimes forgotten that there were actually a number of other very significant artists also really emerging uh, around that time. And I think Fiona Banner is one of them and, and who has continued to kind of build on very innovative and interesting work that we began to see uh, in the 90s. I remember as a young curator working at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, in fact, when, uh, in, I think it was 1997, Fiona's uh, The Nam book was published and, and appeared, uh, an extraordinary 1,000 page book that included transcriptions written by her of scene by scene accounts of um, war movies about Vietnam. Uh, including, of course, Apocalypse Now, uh, which had been based on uh, the Conrad novel <coughs> Heart of Darkness, which has also been a, a kind of long-time interest, if not obsession, of, of Fiona's. Um, but I think that, uh, that fascination with language and image and how those two things intersect and overlap and clash 
and somehow meet and don't meet has been at the core of, of Fiona's work. Um, and of course, her, her love of uh, the word and the published word uh, is seen in her, her artist books and, and other publications, things that sometimes we overlook about language, but which also make it function, or without which it couldn't function, uh, like punctuation. As large-scale bronzes, um, or more recently as bean bags. Um, Fiona's even uh, created her own font uh, and, and published a recent book using nothing but that. Through sculpture, through drawing, film, performance, and installation, Fiona has transformed familiar objects into captivating works of art. Uh, her Tate Duveen Gallery's commission was an, an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary piece landing uh, fighter planes, Harrier and, Harrier and Jaguar, in the middle of the Tate Britain. Her objects are always found in the world around us, but also can be radically transformed, such as the decommissioned tornado jet uh, reborn as a giant bell that members of the public could ring. And in fact, her public engagement is going to really be a, a specific focus tonight as Fiona leads us through a discussion of her work. Fiona was born in 1966 in Merseyside. Don't know quite where that is. Somewhere in the UK. Uh, and she lives and works in London, where she also studied uh, and graduated from Goldsmiths. Her recent solo exhibitions include Whoop, Whoop, Whoop and, uh, at Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Don't know if I got the pronunciation there. Um, the Vanity Press in Edinburgh, and a major survey that's actually currently on view at the Icon Gallery in Birmingham. She, of course, has a long and distinguished exhibition history and works in major collections around the world. So please join me in welcoming Fiona Banner. When uh, Nicholas uh, extended the invitation to me to come to New York and um, talk about public art. I was, um, I was intrigued and it really um, made me reflect on my practice through this um, idea or context of public art. And um, I was intrigued because it's not a, uh, a strand that I've uh, acknowledged previously as being particularly uh, strong in my uh, practice. So um, I started reflecting on what signifies public art uh, to me. <coughs> so clearly work that exists outside of the rarefied environment of um, the gallery or museum or collection um, and uh, that exists in the public sphere. So um, I started to realize that I had been making public art for quite some time, um, though not in, uh, perhaps in the obvious, most obvious of ways. Um, and I'd like to uh, start with just talking a little bit about this uh, project, the NAM, which <coughs> Nicholas touched on earlier. Um, so publishing came into my uh, practice a long time ago, and um, I wanted to start the talk with um, my, uh, my first publication. And... Uh, um, in part because publishing and books have never been um, on the outskirts of my practice. They've always been uh, at the heart of it. So I wouldn't, for instance, put uh, a, um, a unique uh, sculpture, uh, place that in any higher uh, regard than um, 
uh, a publication that might be that might be uh, you know a, a ten thousand print run of. Um, when I was growing up, um, the my formative. Um, experience of visual culture was uh, through the telly and um, I thinking back to the uh, late uh, 60s and uh, early 70s where everybody watched a lot of telly by the way for those that uh, weren't around then and um, and the thing that seemed to be on the telly that somehow got ingrained in my uh, visual sense, I think more than anything else, was uh, the Vietnam War. And um, that was a conflict in which the image, uh, the televisual image, the documentary image, uh, played an extraordinary role. It has been described as the first TV war. Um, and the images that came, came back from uh, Vietnam actually had a, an extremely uh, dominant effect on how um, things developed in that conflict. Uh, years later, I realized that I was quite involved in uh, a different bit of visual culture surrounding um, Vietnam, and that was um, Vietnam movies, Nam movies. Um, and I, uh, I really liked those films, um, Apocalypse Now, Full Metal Jacket, Deer Hunter, etc. cetera. Um, I became quite immersed in them, but at the same time, I, 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 I started to realize how much I loathed them as well. So I was seduced by them on one level, and on another level was um, really repelled by them. Um, and uh, even more extraordinarily, uh, I realized uh, after a while of sort of um, have this thing having gone from uh, enthusiasm to uh, a sort of something more reflective, I realized that my sense of history um, and understanding of Vietnam, the geographic place and the historical and zone and uh, its, uh, its history was informed by those movies. So the making of the NAM was to some extent uh, an exploration of my own um, ignorance and that of other members of, of my generation. Um, I uh, painstakingly described the uh, movies in, in my own words and they ended up making this massive uh, thousand page super movie of a book. Um, I'm going to play a, a clip from um, a work that I, uh, I, I made after finishing this book, which was called Trance. Trees in the distance fill up the foreground. They hardly move. Maybe the stop tops are swaying a bit, but the sky behind is dull and pale blue. A wispy bit of cloud floats across the bottom. A slow ro rotating sound from somewhere else gets louder, but still sounds distant. And a heavy-looking grey copter moves across the sky in front of the trees. It moves slowly, but it's gone quickly. And then some yellow dust floats up in the wind and follows behind it, then just fades into the green. There's some music just strobing away, about to get to something. And then a bit more yellow dust smokes up, leaving a huge silence behind it. Then the music kicks in. Nothing happens but dust. Then the trees behind turn the dust green, and you can only see their tops. Then the rotor sound fades in again, and another copter flies higher up this time. And you can only see the bottom rails. It's past, leaving the same misted-out background. So quietly, silently, three fires flare up into the trees. They roll upwards, blinding orange, then three more explode. One, two, three. They roll into one ginormous, billowing ball. It's so huge, it's everything. Then it disappears into its own smoke, deep, murky, impenetrable, poisonous green. Just a small fleck of orange flame shows through, and the music, it's singing, comes through too. It's all slow and building. This is the end. It's like the first time. It's so deep, all that smoky green. And uh, part of the inspiration for making that uh, talking book was... Um, that uh, when I finished writing um, the NAM, a friend of mine, a novelist, um, Jeff Dyer, said to me, um, I called him up and said, I've finished the book, would you like to read it? And he said, well, I couldn't possibly, it's unreadable, isn't it? So I um, put the phone down in a fury and then uh, laughed at myself afterwards 
uh, realizing that I'd written this ginormous um, tome with no chapter breaks um, uh, or indeed paragraph breaks in it. And I was surprised that uh, a, a more conventional writer had described it as unreadable. Um, there was, at, at that point in time, it didn't really feel like there was any um, culture for, for this project, so I put uh, a fair amount of effort into, one, a, a fly posting campaign. Um, at the time, I worked for a fly posting um, company, so that was a natural thing to do. I did things like um, the Nam van, which I drove around um, to various uh, art venues. This was at um, the Berlin Art Fair, when I, uh, I had a sort of mobile library of Nam books. Uh, this was a launch at Printed Matter, your, your very own Printed Matter, in a um, bookshop in, when it was in Soho some 20 years ago. Um, and then the fly posting campaign turned into sort of uh, more uh, sort of a, a collage type um, pieces. This is a, um, a clip from a room at the, uh, um, in the exhibition that I just opened at uh, Icon in Birmingham. Um, one of my favorite things that was ever written about the NAM was Fiona Banner's The NAM is not so much a coffee table as a coffee table. It's not so much a coffee table book as a coffee table. So it was only recently that um, I actually made that coffee table and that's the big... <coughs> um, piece of furniture in the foreground. Possibly the film that I was most um, involved with of the um, NAM suite of films was Apocalypse Now, and um, the clip that I just played you was uh, from the opening scenes of Apocalypse Now. I made some very big um, drawings uh, dis describing that um, film. And as Nicholas mentioned, one of the uh, narrative templates for um, Coppola's movie um, was uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. I was intrigued um, to, uh, only a couple of years ago, come across this uh, film script uh, on the internet, sort of tucked away, and um, it's a script that was written by Orson Welles uh, in 1939, uh, and it, it was to be his first movie. Um, I published this uh, script. Uh, I, I actually got in touch with the Orson Welles estate uh, to inquire about the status of the, um, of the script, and as soon as I contacted them, it had disappeared promptly from the internet, but fortunately I downloaded it and was able to publish it and um, disseminate it through uh, fair, tr fair um, trade and fair education means, which um, meant it was copyright exempt. Um, I then ended up in an extremely protracted um, dialogue with the Wells estate. I was so intrigued that this film had, had, had never come to light, and it turned out that it had, in all the year, these years, uh, never been made, uh, never been performed. I thought that was extraordinary. So Wells's first film actually went on to be Citizen Kane, not this film, which had been buried for various reasons, um, one of which, I think, was at the time uh, on the edge of the rise of um, fascism in Europe. It perhaps seemed too contentious, too pointed. Um, after uh, many months of uh, dialogue, I did uh, get the uh, permission from the Wells estate to make a performance of what was to be the world premiere of Wells's script of Heart of Darkness. I performed, um, I devised a performance on board this um, building. Uh, we are looking at the small boat on top of the um, Queen Elizabeth Hall, which is at the South Bank Centre in, uh, in London. Um, and that building is actually based on this craft, but it was based on uh, 
a, a, this craft as it was described in uh, Conrad's book, Heart of Darkness. So Conrad uh, toured up the um, River Congo in a, book, in, in a boat called the Roi de Belge. I worked with an architect to make a, a boat that, uh, a, well, a, a form, a vessel, and uh, to some extent a building that represented that, um, that boat. And it was here that I, uh, I staged Heart of Darkness. So Conrad's novel, some of you may know, is um, uh, set uh, on the River Thames, but tells a story of his extraordinary journey up the River Congo in search of the uh, mysterious renegade Mr. Kurtz. Uh, it's a story of um, trade and corruption, desire, lust, our own conflict. Um, and one thing that intrigued me about Wells's um, rendition of uh, Heart of Darkness is that it was set in New York. So the project became known, uh, be assumed the working title of Thames and Hudson, the two rivers that uh, seem to uh, be key to this novel. I worked with the actor Brian Cox, and um, the pe he performed the piece live to camera, which was live beamed down to the Purcell room, uh, a theater four floors below, and then it was um, broadcast on the internet for uh, um, several months afterwards. Um, on completion of that uh, project, I started also to think about what, how to situate, what, what's important about Heart of Darkness now? Why is this book always boomerang, boomeranging back at us? And why, why does every generation seem to apply its own uh, lens on, uh, on, on this text? Um, At the same time, I was invited by a uh, London-based um, organization, the Archive of Modern Conflict, to uh, curate from their very extensive holdings of images that relate to uh, mainly photographic, ephemeral images, I should say, that relate to, con to conflict. Um, and I went there with trepidation because the image is something that I tend to move around in my work rather than engage with directly. And I knew it would present me with, uh, with a problem, but nonetheless, I went along and spent a lot of time there. And the longer I spent there, the less I could find anything that I felt able to work with and represent. Um, so, I ended up being quite overwhelmed by this sense that conflict is always elsewhere. There were very few images from London, um, for instance, and I thought that was interesting. So my, uh, I thought that was an omission. So my, um, my project with them that I proposed was that I placed some images from uh, London into the archive, and I then uh, contacted a um, magnum conflict photographer, Paolo Pellegrin, and worked with him very closely. I asked him to, uh, I commissioned him to photograph the city of London, London's financial district, as a conflict zone. Um, the artist community in London has grown up on the edge of the city of London, and uh, I, for many years, have lived just outside um, what's known as the square, square mile. <laughs> um, the city has its own customs, its own laws, its own um, electoral privileges. And um, I was really um, 
interested in the fact that I'd lived for so long on the edge of um, the city, but really knew very little about it. And um, I, um, I gave Paolo Pellegrin the text of Heart of Darkness, and together we explored the city, and um, he made, uh, in fact, an extraordinary amount of photographs. He made 60,000 images and then went, um, went back to, to work in Africa, which is where, where he spends um, much of his time. And I was left with the job of dealing with these images. Um, I realized in the end there were so many of them that they were um, more like a, um, a film, really, than uh, a sequence of single images. And um, as a result, I ended up making a film from these uh, images. And this is a clip from that film. It's called Mr. Kurtz, He Not Dead. Those um, images then found their natural place in a, uh, a new publication of Conrad's book, Heart of Darkness, which I published this year. Uh, there it is being provoked by an um, electronic windsock. Um, So um, this publication takes the form of a Vogue magazine. Um, the font on the cover um, of the book is um, derived from Dido, the font that is, is used by um, Vogue. And it's, um, I wanted it to be redolent of, um, unattainable desire in, in some way, this, this book. So it's extremely tactile and very uh, seductive, but at the same time, a somewhat worrying uh, object. And um, I, uh, having published the work then, put it to, um, to another use as the protagonist in a, um, in a more recent film called Phantom. This is a short clip from that film.
the, um, the title is derived from uh, a drone phantom camera, which um, the book is uh, filmed by. So the um, downdraft from the quadcopter that um, transports the, the camera is quite considerable. I, uh, I found out when I started experimenting with, uh, with this project. And um, I, to begin with, wanted to make it inside and um, crashed about 13, 14 different um, drone copters. In the end, I realized it had to be an e exterior film, something set in the landscape. Um, and um, I, I was excited by the idea that this uh, camera cannot quite capture what it is trying to capture. It cannot actually uh, embody the image that it's, it's trying to, to um, embody because of its own mechanism. So the closer the um, camera gets, the more the downdraft worries and, and flaps the pages and harries the, um, the publication and, and chases it uh, until in the end it's a cat and mouse game between the two and um, the magazine and, and becomes um, torn and eventually destroyed. Um, in one way I, uh, I was frustrated by my inability to uh, control that camera, um, as, as you do, sort of try and control uh, the quadcopter on a little um, a handheld device. And in another way, I was excited by the fact that I was not actually framing the image, and I started to think of this as a kind of uh, anti-cinematic film in in that way. Um, it also struck me that there are two things uh, happening uh, with the film. One is that um, it's uh, this new way of, uh, that, that we have in the um, uh, public domain of, of, of making images. And the other is, of course, that there's a crossover between the drone uh, camera and uh, the drone as a military um, piece of um, hardware, um, which is something that, um, a, an interest that has been running through my work for a very long time. Um, so this is a, uh, a snapshot from uh, my archive of, um, that I've called All the World's Fighter Planes. And uh, to begin with, I started collecting these images from newspapers because I, um, I wanted to make drawings of these um, aircraft. Um, and indeed, I, I did start making drawings of these aircraft uh, a long time ago, before I was at art college. And for some reason that I guess was to do with uh, an, a, some kind of anxiety I, um, and some sort of unresolved interest in these aircraft. I carried on making them to this very day. And uh, this collection in the end embodied every kind of fighter plane and helicopter that is currently in, in service today. Um, this is a, a um, detail of the suite of drawings that I started making some uh, 27 years ago and uh, um, uh, completed a couple of years, late, years ago. Um, the source material also found its way into a um, publication, which I called All the World's Fighter Planes. And I was intrigued that um, by the names of these aircraft, um, so the cover is, of the book is a taxonomy of, of the, the nicknames for these uh, 
these plains, so many of which seem to be drawn from nature. Uh, lion cub, tornado, um, black hawk, um, harrier, etc. So something sort of almost primitive in the titling or in, in the nicknaming of, of these aircraft, but also, of course, they are haute um, technology at the same time. Uh, I've been going to air shows since I was um, a child, the sort of military PR displays that um, the uh, Royal Air Force puts on in, in the summer months and find them appalling events and yet somehow oddly appealing and exciting, riveting events. Um, I find these aircraft really, really uh, beautiful and really terrifying. And, and, and I guess the fact that I find them beautiful brings my own uh, aesthetic judgment into, into question in, in, in many ways. And I, I think that's been part of uh, the contradiction that sustained my uh, uh, interest in them in, in terms of my working practice. Uh, these are um, two nose cones. Um, this is a, a, a recent work, uh, two nose cones from a uh, Harrier jump jet. So I thought the nose cone is in a way the most heroic uh, part of the aircraft, but it's also there's something comic about the, the nose cone, the very fact that it's called a nose, the, um, the anthropomorphism of these aircrafts is that there's, there's something intriguing and endearing and also absurd um, about that anthropomorphism. In, in these, this case, uh, I placed these two uh, nose combs side by side to read like a pair of breasts, but also like a trophy object. Um, I drew a, a pattern uh, based on pinstripe um, in graphite on them. This is another uh, nose art piece. It's a, it's, a, it's a nude, a description of a nude on, um, on a piece of aircraft, a female nude. And um, you find with nose, nose art, which within the military is a strange form of folk art, um, and to some extent a kind of um, superstitious, interesting sort of mystical form of, um, of, of working as well. Um, but you find often that it's quite lewd or quite sexual. Um, and um, I became interested in, um, in the aircraft that uh, was known as Buster Gonad and sported this... Um, particular piece of nose art during the first Gulf War in, uh, during Desert Storm. I eventually bought this uh, aeroplane. It's a jaguar, again, a predatory animal. And um, by the time I bought it, unfortunately, it didn't have the Viz cartoon painted on the, um, on the nose cone anymore. So it was... Um, it was an easier gesture for me to strip and, and polish the aircraft to this uh, mirror finished as I did. Um, the plane was placed upside down. I, in my mind, I like a massive um, nude in the neoclassical galleries at, at Tate Britain. Uh, the highly reflective surface meant that it was essentially a large rather quirky mirror. Um, it was only when I stood back from the plane having installed it that I realized why it was, had, was nicknamed Buster Gonad. And that's, I assume, because of the two large um, back burners at the back of the um, aircraft. So this is the front of, uh, of Tate Britain, which is a gallery that in, in, many way, in, in, in no way really would expect this kind of work to be placed within it. There are quite a lot of uh, 
museums and gallery spaces in the world that might preempt something so uh, monumental and industrial, but not this one. Um, and in fact, to get the aircraft into the gallery, I had to dismantle them like an airfix model and reconfigure them in the space because there is literally no um, goods way or, or lift that could, um, that has that, the capacity to hold them. Uh, the Harrier um, derives its nickname from uh, the Harrier Hawk, which then has it, takes its, in turn takes its name from harrying, worrying, hunting down. Um, I installed it here like a um, sort of court trophy or a, um, a dead bird. I don't know if you can read from the slide that it's tattooed with a feather-like pattern. This was an extremely um, popular exhibition. I say that not to flatter myself, but um, because it uh, was significant that people really wanted to come and look at these objects up close. And there is a peculiar enthusiasm for these objects um, that exists outside of, of the fact that I'd um, turn them into sculptures. At the end of this uh, exhibition, there was a, a big discussion about what was to happen uh, to the works. And I felt very strongly that they were um, public objects and that they shouldn't exist in a private uh, collection. So um, in the end I resolved to, there was some discussion then about how to store them and um, I in the end resolved to um, store them in the way that metal is best stored as ingots, which is how they exist today. I have actually exhibited these ingots and I did stamp each of them individually with the name either Harrier or Jaguar. So the naming, the name was incredibly important from, from the start and that's, that's how they exist at this point. But I would see them as a, a objects in storage and um, it was always my intention to recast them into something else, but at this point I know not what. Um, to continue with uh, language, of course, language is the stuff we use, um, and it's uh, our greatest enabler, but also our um, is hugely frustrating as well. So here I am trying to discuss this uh, visual work in uh, to wrap words around it and um, suspend it in language and help it through language. In some ways I can do that, in other ways I can't. I started making sculptures of um, full stops at a time when I was experiencing an extreme frustration with language. The, the stuff that had got me out of dodge with images then itself became extremely frustrating. Language as my medium um, is also sometimes inadequate. Um, the full stops came about as a way of exploring that gap. Um, so I was thinking of the full stop, yes, as a breath as uh, a crucial uh, element of language, but also something that is absent from content. 
And that enabled me to carry on uh, working and exploring my... Um, It, it, it really, I suppose, enabled me to work through a, a period of time when I didn't really know how to work. And to this day, I still sometimes make these full-stop sculptures at such times. Um, the one in uh, the image is from a font called Clang. And um, here it is being used as a um, skateboarder's ramp. I found this image on YouTube. Um, I strongly believe that if work is in the public domain, that the public should be able to engage with it. I enjoy the uh, tactility of uh, these works outside. And when I was placing them, or working through the placing of them, there was a lot of discussion about whether they should be on plinths or whether they should be in some way cordoned off. And I said, well, they can't be on plinths. They are plinths. And, of course, you know, the full stop to some extent is a plinth for language. And in the absurdist gesture of making it three-dimensional, it also becomes like a character in a form of its, of its own. And then in that moment becomes quite simply pumped punctuation in space. So I'm intrigued by the way people move around these works, uh, even the way that people scratch their names into them, sometimes the need to write on a full stop. More recently, and this goes hand in hand with um, film coming into my practice. I've made these um, full stops as bean bags. Uh, so they are quite literally pauses in that way that you can sit and um, be on. So again, um, looking at language as a medium to some extent. Um, over the years, my work has become intensely um, verbal and descriptive, using deploying narrative in a narrative um, language in a narrative way and um, also in a pictorial way. When recently I was asked to do a uh, survey show, the first um, survey show actually that I've um, done, I started to think about the possibility of surveying your own practice. That's, it is actually not possible. But I liked the idea of an attempted overview. And one of the things that I enjoyed was looking at the things that I've worked with, perhaps most intimately in a funny way, over um, time. And fonts are things that I've spent many, many, many um, hours uh, on a one-on-one -on -one relationship with. Um, so for this exhibition, I um, decided to make a particular font. And that font um, is called Font. Um, and it's a uh, amalgam, as uh, I hope this partially might explain, of um, all the fonts that I've worked with. So any font that I've significantly work with, worked with, I put into this family tree mating kind of scenario, and I ended up with one um, slightly uh, misbehaving, um, slightly misbehaved bastard font called font. For the um, exhibition, I requested that the gallery amended all their signage and um, everything was uh, re-signed using font. It intrigued me that this uh, uber 
digital process had produced something that actually looked really, it looked almost medieval, almost kind of hewn or, or carved. Um, and that's something that seems to come up a lot for me, how technology is also something extremely primitive. Um, and the entranceway to this um, exhibition, Scroll Down, Keep Scrolling, is the title of it, um, is a baptismal font. I'd started musing about the um, possible crossovers between the font, this sort of fluid, extremely ephemeral um, courier for language, uh, as in a typeface, and font as in um, a baptismal font, something associated with naming, language, engendering, um, but something that is very much, though a vessel, an object. I, um, I ended up procuring this um, ex-spiritual or um, ex-ritualistic object of um, th this uh, baptismal font and um, deployed it for, to a sculptural end. Uh, and in fact, I engraved it with the word font written in, in my um, typeface font. Um, I found out that the two, um, two words, font and font, actually have no etymological crossover. Um, but I thought, in a way, maybe they did, because I was thinking of the words, you know, font, a font of meaning, a font of life, a um, font as a courier, font as a, a vessel, but also... Um, I started looking then at the very object of the font and thinking it is strangely glyph-like, strangely letter-like uh, in and of itself. Uh, my most recent publication is um, this, this book, which uh, is a kind of anti-catalogue in that it's full of images uh, that have not uh, thus far been deemed um, publication or print worthy. So they're extremely, it's, it's compiled of extremely um, sort of casual, what you might call um, uh, ephemeral type images, uh, images of work that was perhaps not completed or um, uh, work that was in process or images of work in the process of being installed, anything but the final image that suggests the work is complete. And I wanted to make the book in this way because I thought in the internet age, all of those images that one might normally uh, dignify a catalogue with are available on the internet. And therefore the purpose of a catalogue must surely be something different now. So this book is uh, entirely full of those images and workings that are not otherwise visible. I called it um, Scroll Down, Keep Scrolling, because um, I thought that the action of scrolling is something incredibly contemporary. It's something we do all the time. I'm standing here doing it. Um, and yet, scroll refers to something even pre-books. Um, but also, it, the term scroll down and keep scrolling term refers to the idea of something not having an end um, or potentially a beginning, which I enjoy. That actually is the end of my talk. Fiona, I think we, we have some time for questions, if, uh, if you'd be up for that. Sure. Um, if you have a question, please... If you're um, up for it. <laughs> yeah, 
please raise your hand and we'll pass these um, microphones around. Maybe I will ask you something just to, um, to start, which I was intrigued, one, with your very long time fascination with these um, aircraft and the military fighter planes. Mm. Uh, and your characterization of that as sort of a simultaneous attraction repulsion. Mm. And I'm wondering in the works you've done, say uh, the Devine Gallery's um, work, you know, did, do you find that the, the audience reaction to works of yours that, that include or evoke those forms are similar? Um, I mean, you mentioned it was very popular. I'm just curious about, um, say the uh, you know the repulsion part and what happens to that sorry Nicholas um, uh, what happens to it personally uh, I mean I guess I was thinking you know, how, how audiences, re, you know, relate to it or what kinds of responses. Oh, yes. Um, okay. Um, well, I think the response is uh, extremely uh, varied. For instance, with uh, Harrier and Jaguar, the um, two, two sculptures of fighter planes. Um, the, the reaction changed over time, actually. Um, so, for instance, uh, I'd done an awful lot of research into those planes. Uh, as I was taking custody of them, I felt I needed to know uh, what their function had been. And um, one of them has had a very active uh, military service and uh, been involved in uh, many uh, airstrikes. Uh, but as part of this uh, research, I... Um, Got, uh, ended up in dialogue with quite a lot of um, pilots and in some case people that had been involved with those particular aircraft who were infuriated by um, my uh, use of them to begin with. But over a period of time and quite a lot of dialogue, um, the, it turned out that the sort of sus suspicion allayed and it was quite interesting that they were so... Uh, I think they... Uh, I think they were suspicious of what a female artist was doing with these these objects, and um, uh, so, so it's interesting. You think it would have been different if you were a male artist? Maybe. I mean, I have to say, just having bobbed around quite a lot in the um, air, you know, military aircraft, uh, decommissioned aircraft scene, you don't come across many women. <laughs> And there is, uh, so there's, there's always a frisson of mistrust and strangeness due to uh, that simple and obvious fact that I am a woman. Um, and, uh, and then I think in terms of um, the art public, there's uh, perhaps another suspicion in that uh, using objects that have such a dynamic and um, strong uh, currency is um, audacious and, and, and um, is, is provocative and, uh, well, I, I personally believe very complex, so I would, I would, um, my, I myself am suspicious of it. Um, but I don't think that those, uh, moments of contradiction or suspicion or even self-suspicion -sus are uh, things to be ignored. I mean, for me, that's the very uh, motivation and stuff of being an artist. That is the particular terrain that I am able to um, inhabit as an artist. Um, so it's about those contradictions and... Uh, um, uh, Dualities. And yes, yes. Brianna, thank you very much. It's been really enjoyable tonight. But I was intrigued about you know your obs obsession from early youth and your talks about going to the 
airfield and seeing the sort of strange, almost, well, terrifying objects and yet being ex enjoying them in a certain sense. But I'm more interested really in the process that you've found when you're working and how the distractions of process have interested you. You know, you're talking about the reflective sur surfaces, you're talking about many, many themes that are underlying it. But I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about process and how that sort of either distracts you from your original theme, if you, if you call it a theme, or whether it, you know, and how it enhances it, distracts it or enhances it. I think that's a really hard question to answer. Um, but process is not, I think it's hard because process is not separate from the negotiation that one has or that I would have around an object. So I would say all the difficulties of dealing with uh, something like a fighter plane are part of the um, discussion around what it is in the world and what it means then to transpose that into an inappropriate environment. Um, or I would say, for instance, with the Orson Welles material, the incredible uh, sort of the overpowering um, sense of uh, ownership that the Wells estate has, that all the difficulties to do with, that what came, in, came my way to do with making that, um, that film uh, were part of the subject of the film. That is indeed actually part of the theme of Heart of Darkness. So I think these things are not really separated off. Um, uh, the process of writing something then becomes, uh, you know, is part of the negotiation of, of the things I'm thinking about and in the end would dictate the form of a book or a spoken word piece. Thank or you. I'll be thinking about that question when I go to bed tonight, <laughs> by the way. Thanks. <laughs> Did you have a very different understanding of the films that you transcribed? And can you talk a little bit about how you felt about them having transcribed them? Um, I suppose the process of transcribing something is uh, you, you become very intimate with it and you notice things that you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't notice otherwise. I mean, I guess you could say Watching something is like driving. Uh, transcribing something is like walking. You just note there's a level of detail, a level of intimacy um, that develops. But uh, also, yes, things are revealed and um, things to do with language, things to do with uh, the uh, in strategies, um, aesthetic, propagandist, whatever, that might be embedded in those um, films, reveal themselves on you, to you, as they kind of play on you. But I, I didn't find the films any uh, less seductive or um, through working very closely with them, but um, I did find them increasingly problematic, but I, w I, w I was uh, uh, drawn to them because of the, the problems of, of them in a way, of, or how they kind of played on, on, on me, on others. Um, hi, uh, this is um, a question about the first work that you presented called the Nam. Um, how do you feel about making an art piece that is basically like based on like 
the death of like more than a million people that are still suffering today and are homeless in the U.S. Um, and like, what do you do with like the like the money, like the profit of it, and like, how do you feel about that? Um, well, I'm very interested in looking at how conflict is culturalized and how Hollywood has uh, negotiated and uh, used conflict. Um, how I feel about the uh, work in as a, a political element uh, is that it's useful to look at the how the big powers are peddling culture and dealing with conflict. Um, and I think it's interesting to explore our ignorances and um, our indulgences around uh, history, current and, and, uh, and current conflicts. Um, so those are the things that, uh, that's the terrain that the work is in for me in terms of financial, a uh, financial dimension. Uh, I don't think I've, there isn't really any great uh, financial uh, dimension to my publishing projects. They don't, uh, though fortunately the uh, books are well distributed, they, they're not made for renew financial remuneration. So that hasn't been an issue. A, a similar discussion would apply to Heart of Darkness as well, by the way. I just wanted to ask you a couple more questions about the planes, if I could. Some of the, um, you had, like for instance, why did you decide to do anything with them? Why didn't you just put them in the gallery? Mm. Why did you have two? Why not one? Why were mm. they not both treated in the same way, mm -hmm. placed in the same way? You, you know, those sort of decisions, was, did it relate to the names? Or, you know, like, because mm -hmm. the, ha the Harrier was hanging? That sort of thing really interests me. Mm -hmm. Also, the other thing is, why do you consider that inappropriate? I'd consider that exactly appropriate in okay. terms of my, my, my humble definition of art. Um, well, they seemed exactly wrong in that space. There was an awkwardness to them, the fact that they barely fitted in there. Um, it seemed in one way right, but in another way very awkward and wrong. And Yes, yes. Um, so while I muse further this uh, question of appropriate and inappropriate, um, perhaps jarring, it would be a, a, a better, better word. Um, I, uh, I really wanted to work with planes that were currencies, so planes that were currently in service. That felt important that there was, that we all had a sense of ownership over them, though that you know, one might not want that sense. Um, you know, as taxpayers, we were, we're all involved, or at that point in the UK, we're all involved in those uh, planes. And um, they, there was issues to do with size. Within, um, I wanted the Jaguar to be, I wanted planes that had name, the animal names. Um, they um, were available. Um, with the Harrier, the fact that it's named after a bird um, uh, led me to think that it could be like a sort of hunting trophy um, hung, hung up um, there. And they were both, I think, um, emasculated but re-negotiated uh, as uh, sculptural objects. Um, and um, the way that I, I'd already done a lot to them anyway. They were no longer planes. They'd been taken apart and put back together. So um, it seemed a natural 
thing to then work with them a little bit more. And um, one, to turn one into a mirror so that it reflects you back um, it, on its surface. Um, and yet yeah, it sort of anim animates you or is animated by the, the viewer, seemed to create more, it made it very, very um, sexy. Um, so sort of increase the sense of worrying involvement. It was very, very um, beautiful. And, um, and then to uh, decorate the other one with the feathers seemed like a, a, a natural way to go. OK. Uh, beg your pardon? Is it the same thing with the nose? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think we have time for one last question you know, on your other side there. Um, about the Harrier, um, I was I was noticing that the the vertical um, land, uh, the vertical takeoff engines are taking off. I'm I'm not sure that is. I feel like the Harrier, the main uh, advantage was the uh, the vertical uh, takeoff, but I don't find the engines that implicates on the on your work. But I'm not sure it's because of the uh, you get it from the uh, government that's defective, or or it's or was it just the process that like you have to cut off and put it in a um, uh, museum? From a, from a weight point of view, the it wasn't viable to use the engines, mm. um, and um, I, I would. I would just say again that they were they were sculptural objects. I wasn't they they were no longer fighter planes. Um, at the point that um, I I exhibited them, um, the engine on the um, Harrier is is concealed, anyway. But. Oh yeah, well that 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 engine when is for for vertical liftoff is uh, sometimes concealed and sometimes exposed exposed during vertical liftoff. Yeah, but I could I didn't have engines for either of them anyway because of the weight. Uh, and they yes they were changed in various ways. As I said, they were for one totally taken apart and and uh, reconfigured. I think we're, we're perhaps uh, glimpsing even in the discussion tonight the sort of uh, fascination that these, these objects, um, so multi-layered and, uh, and such rich fodder for, um, for artistic investigation. And I think Fiona shared with us uh, an incredible range of insights into uh, a whole career-long uh, engagement with those issues, and I'd like you to join me in, in thanking Fiona Bannock. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>